Today, I'm on my way to meet Stephen Gillen, who is said to be one of Britain's most feared gangsters and armed robbers. After being forced to serve almost 17 years in a Category A high security prison for his crimes, Stephen is not one to shy away from his past. Mr. Gillen also served time with Charles Bronson, who the British press have called the most violent prisoner in Britain. Today I'm here to find out more about the man behind this notorious cape. Stephen has invited us down to his home in Windsor to have a discussion about his past, his recent reform, and his future plans of sharing his story on the big screens of Hollywood. Stephen Jidden, listen, first and foremost, thank you very much for taking the time. I know you're a busy man. There's been a lot going on in the world and I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us to share your incredible story. My pleasure, Leonard. Honestly, it's, uh, I've read you know, your book so far. I've looked at interviews um, and it's just astonishing how much you've been able to transform over the years. And I wanted to have this conversation because I feel like your story is a story that needs to be shared to the different generations. Um, and I feel like you've been able to not only be an example, but you've also been able to mold and, and recreate yourself over the past few years. And I think people could really learn a lot from that. So this is a conversation. This is not a right or wrong interview where there's, you know, correct or politically correct answers. It's really about truth because I feel like through truth, people can really learn. So I really want to, you know, just put that in the air. Now, you grew up in Belfast, you know. Yeah, yeah. I was, I, I was born here, but I was taken over there as as a baby. I was six months old. Wow. Uh, my parents, who actually come from there, mm. this was in the time of a civil war over there. It was really so. I and I come back to this country then, when I was nine years of age. Mm. Wow. How did Belfast mould and shape you initially before you, you know, before you came over here? How did that impact you? Um, first thing is, my mother left me there to come back to try and build a life for us over here. So I wasn't with my mother, so that was a kind of an effect, you know. The dynamic wasn't ideal how it should be. But I was with wonderful people over there, aunts and uncles, and they was wonderful people. They were religious people. But... Because of the trouble over there, I was very sheltered as a uh, child. But, um, you know, it's in the book even. You know, I see a lot of trauma over there, a lot of traumatic stuff over there. Um, uh, I see someone get shot in front of me. I was seven. I got caught in a riot. You know, I had to watch him die in front of me and call for his mother. You know, this took about 20 minutes, you know, and I was seven years of age then, you know, hiding behind the hedge. So, you know, if you could just think about stuff like that, that was horrendous for me. So, What was the impact so, on, on, on you at that time when, you, when you're seeing a human, a human being as a boy die in front of you? I think for me then, I mean, I'd been caught in a riot. They used to just start like that. The shooting would start from the flats, firebombs, cars overturned on fire, you know, all of this stuff, people, uh, rubber bullets. This was the scene and, you know, I ran, I hid behind a hedge as you do as a child for kind of safety. You couldn't go in the road, the shops was really, was really being traded. This, uh, this guy he was only a young guy uh, now, looking back. Um, he had a gun, you know, he was shooting and, you know, they caught him, you know, he took a couple of shots in the chest, he fell back. So I was only a couple of metres away from him. But, you know, he was calling for his mother and all uh, blood coming out of his mouth. You know, I mean, I was really crying, you know. I mean, I was absolutely terrified, you know. I was even trying to talk to him. It was horrendous for me because no one could move and he was trapped there. I was rooted to the spot. So, you know, I had to stay there while he, while he, while he was dying. A couple of people, his comrades, they come, they pulled him back after a while. But this was a long, long time, you know. We're talking 20 minutes, Leonard. So it had an impact where... That was absolutely shocking to me, and I um, it was an introduction to a world I hadn't known, even though I was around this kind of activity, and that certainly changed me to the point where um, you know, I would, it kept this down really, and I didn't even speak about this alone in any detail to anyone, till about 
seven years ago. So all them years I carried that. And your mum went away to come to find opportunities in London, correct? Yes. How 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 did you interpret that when you was when you were young? Did it feel like she'd left, or did you? Did you? Know she was the truth is, that? it was very very hard. You know, and this was um, very hard for me to cope with. You know, uh, another part of that was my surrogate mother, uh, Madge, who you know, such a wonderful person, such a kind and beautiful soul. She died of cancer. This is one of the reasons why I was brought back over to uh, to England. You know, she died of cancer. So, you know, that was another real trauma for me. That someone who was everything to me had suddenly been been taken. And then I'm, you know, I'm... I was the little child with the little suitcase, really, on the ship, going to somewhere I didn't know where. You know, I really was an alien place. And that's how that was for me that time. Did you feel responsible for yourself? At that age, or were you hoping someone would, would arrive and save you? I think uh, I was an anxious child. It made me very anxious. This stuff that I've been through, this uncertainty, this being moved, it pushed and pulled all the time. You know, at sea without a paddle, it was really like that. And I, this pattern would keep going for a lot of my life. And I went on, you know, into the organised crime thing and ended up in prison. Mm-hmm. You know, for over a decade, unfortunately. But um, so this was the start of the pattern, really. You know, when I come back to London, you know, although London was a fast place and uh, Belfast and the war zone was much faster, mm-hmm. it was different. So I was getting in trouble really, really early. And it, it started to go wrong for me, really, when I come back. Of course, I spoke funny then, you know, and everything was different uh, for me. So I was different. So I had all that to contend with. So you moved to London, nine years old, Barnet Grove, East London. Well, it's best not, yeah. Tell, tell me what, what that, just looking back at that time, how did that feel? What did that, what, did, what was East London like? What was the environment, atmosphere? Um, I've always loved London, you know, I have a lot of memories, you know, a lot of friends, obviously, you know, in East London. I, I grew up there. I have friends all over London, but the middle bit was for me, Leonard, how it was, was when I, when I come back to this country, don't forget, you know, I was nine, you know, I wasn't even 10 years, I was still a child, right? I, I didn't actually, I ended up in foster homes, you know, I ended up in foster homes and this was the start of a downhill, downhill spiral for me. I started to become really, really angry you know, and stuff like that. I uh, started to get behavioural problems, you know. I had to fend for myself, uh, especially emotionally, you know, in all intents and purposes. This was very tough for me, you know, in an alien place. Um, you know, so I'd always get uh, into trouble, a lot of fights and all this stuff in school. You know, I got expelled from school, suspended from school. This was the start of petty crime of kind of going out there on the street and all that and having a surrogate family, really. A surrogate family of street urchins, call it whatever you want, who was kind of just out there, you know. So, you know, I suppose in a sense, we, you know, we was really vulnerable, you know, and susceptible to that. So we kind of gathered together, you know, and we was these kind of guys. You, you mentioned growing up in the foster home, you know, what was that experience like? Um, it's in the book, you know, and I always say it how it is. Because of my criminal stuff then, silly stuff at the start, stealing cars, silly theft, stupid stuff, um, you know, my behavioural problems, right? Um, I was uh, given a care order by the uh, lo- local authority, so I was put into their care. You know, and they started moving me around to all different places. You know, I went to one place in Stevenage and it was um, it was actually like a prison for children looking back. You know, there was a lot of vulnerable, vulnerable children in there, you know, and I was, you know, I was only a little thin, little, little thing then really. I mean, it wasn't this big guy or anything like that. So there was really bullies in there, you know, and, you know, I wasn't having that and trying to stick up for the other younger children. There was a few of us. You know, and they put us through a lot of a lot of abuse. I mean, they'd lock me in, uh, you know, in 
boiler rooms and all this stuff in the dark with rats and all stuff like that. They was very, very dark people in there, you know. And, you know, so we'd run away. We'd run away from that. We'd come back to London. We'd steal some cars. We'd do some stupid stuff. And they'd bring us back. And, you know, this was, this was a, another pattern. What was your introduction to crime, the life of crime at that time? What do you think was, was the, the point in which you started to really take um, steps into that, into that life? It was a, it was a, a progression, as, as I've said, you know, that's why I've kind of, you know, I've, I've given the viewers just a, just a little indication of how that went. It was a process. But I went to prison when I was 14 years of age. That was the first time, detention centre. Yeah. And, you know, I come out, it was the same kind of a thing. And, you know, then I went, used custody. You know, I went through that. So I was in and out, that kind of stuff. So when when they actually let me out of the local uh, authority care at about 16, and I went back to London, you know, and I was kind of free in that sense, then, you know, I was around a lot of the people who I'd kind of known, you know, guns even then, you know, I see my first gun and we was introduced to that stuff when I was 16 and around them times, you know, and we knew the older guys, you know, people in my family and they, so there was criminal, criminal, criminal elements there that was very heavy, that was seen as, you know, the faces, the chaps at that time, who was doing really, really serious crime, like armed robberies, post office vans, security vans, um, protection rackets, can't fit in. Drugs would come later, but serious crime. So we was groomed for that, really. We was, you know, we was lambs to the slaughter, really looking back for that, for that life then. So were you, would you say you were influenced or, or were you kind of, was it, was it innate? Was it something that you wanted to, to also pursue in regards to just being in that environment and being on top of the ladder? Was it, you know, what was it? Was it the, 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 the older guys you were seeing or was it you that wanted to be kind of on top at one point? I think it's, it's both. I think you're definitely groomed, we know that. You know, everyone does in that life, the older ones, to send people out there. You know, you get sent out there, we used to call it, right? So it's the older ones, you know, and um, using their influence, their wisdom and all this stuff, you know, to send other people out to do stuff, right, and protect themselves. But it's kind of like a rite of passage as well, you know, and you have to think of the way I grew up, you know, and I really had to fend for myself in so many ways. So I was really open to the bad elements, yeah. and I ran with that. And one of the things I think it's important to say that I, where I had such an anger in them days, I was one of the guys who you would say really was a loose cannon. You know, I was gamer than everyone else. I was always up the front. I would do more than everyone else. Crazy stuff, mm -hmm. you know, which looking back, I used as a kind of a defense, defense mechanism to, to belong and all that stuff. That just worked for me mm -hmm. and that become a pattern. So of course, when you have a guy like that, I mean, looking back, these guys like that, these characters, they don't last long in that life as such. But of course, they're very useful. So, you know, the older ones, they say, oh, you know, we've got one here, you know, a like-minded. So, you know, that kind of expedited my journey through the ranks, if you want to call it that, into, into more serious stuff. You, you have an aunt, Aunt Medge. Tell me, tell, yeah. tell me a bit about her. Oh, she is just, um, uh, just an unbelievable soul, you know, really. You know, you're talking about someone who you know, in them days, could have been married. She was engaged once, but it actually didn't happen. To, and she just always looked after the family, always looked after the kids, you know. You know, would be saying a rosary for every one of them and I. Everyone knew her, you know, the kind of character where even in that war-torn country with all the hatred between Protestants uh, and Catholics, when she would walk down the road, both sides would say, oh, you know, this aunt Madge, really, you know, she was really known. She was a wonderful character, and um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm very sure that she's followed me um, all the way through my life. Still, and you mentioned her saving your life in regards to being a protector while she was present. How how, how does she protect you? you I think, 
You see, a lot of people, you know, they say, they say, oh, uh, you know, you transformed your life and all that. Yes, of course. Uh, you know, the metamorphosis. But there's more to this this tale because I say, no, actually what happened was I had the, you know, the courage, I had the circumstances, you know, I had the opportunity to find my way back to myself because I always had goodness put in me. So in that way, they certainly saved my life from a young age because I had this good instruction that was put in me. I just lost my way, but found my way back to myself. So you've come from Belfast and then you've gone to London been in the environment around different people that were performing different criminal activities. At one point, did you feel your position or your ranking increasing? What, what, what age were you when you really started to realise, well, I have a bit of weight here? Um, I think uh, in them days that, that there's, you know, people have to understand that, the, you know, that, 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 that fraternity of the day in East London, there was a lot of people who was doing a lot of heavy stuff. It's, it's, it, it's a very close-knit kind of fraternity, you know, with the family I had and different stuff. And many of the people I knew all the way through London and different gangs, if you want to call it that, or firms we used to work with, there is a hierarchy. So when you're already in there, you're already somewhere anyway, right? Because you would know all the faces and different really influential criminal names of the of the day, right? So it was, there was so much going on, you know, and the nature of that life then is that you stick to your own kind of, kind of groups. But, you know, I knew, uh, you know, I knew the most influential people of the day, certainly, you know, the notorious people. And then, you know, I had three trials at the Old Bailey um, for armed robbery. Uh, I beat the first one, second one I beat the conspiracy at Rob, but I got possession of a firearm, you know, and the third one, of, you know, of course, was an ambush by a flying squad after an operation, surveillance, you know, all of this stuff. There were shots fired, it was very dark stuff, um, and um, I got 17 years after that. So. What we was in them days, really, really active at a, at a, at a high level in, in the seriousness and heaviness of what we was doing and the people we was working with, that translated then into prison, mm -hmm. which was a real gang culture again, but we was really trapped and that was very violent. So what was it that was kind of the, the reference to power at that point? Was it, was it money or was it fear? What, what were people responding to more? Was it the guy that was making the most or doing the most crimes or was it the guy that was feared the most? I think, you know, there's definitely guys that we looked up to, there always is, who was the ones we think, you know, want to be like him. He has all the power, all the money, all the cars, all the, you know, all the girls, right, all of this stuff. But when you actually get there, you know, you know, and you realise that the life is not like that, because you know you're constantly paranoid mm -hmm. you know you, you can't really enjoy that money and your head is not like that anyway when you become that person yeah. it's very much like a curse in a way be careful of what you wish for because you might just get it looks great but to actually be there to you know to have to live like that is certainly all that glistens is not gold with that power with that paranoia is that when you first got introduced to drugs or when did drugs start playing a part in your life at that time? I, um, I had, truth is I had addiction problems early on. Addiction problems usually uh, exhibit themselves early on in people. It certainly did me with the behavioural problems. But it's a progressive disease that gets worse as you go along. I mean, my thing in them days there was, you know, we'd be out, all the usual stuff. You know, a lot of cocaine, all of this stuff, which really, you know, and the drinking and different stuff like this. So that, you know, it's not hard to say that this stuff is not good for you within a lifestyle like this. But this is how it was. Wow. So then you get in a situation where you, you, you are partaking in drugs. What was your, your view? Was, was, was life clear at that time? Was it unclear? Was it just fast? How do you recollect that period? Life... 
I was very unclear then, Leonard, because, you know, if you think that you are, you know, you have to remember that the things that we was doing and the life that we was living, in many respects, being, being arrested by the police and going to prison for a few years was, was the least of it because you'd be at war with certain people or you'd have certain fallouts and it was who catches who first and all that. This is a very, very violent, dark kind of a way to live. And so these was the times, you know, you have to live different. You have to watch where you go, what you do. You know, you're using technology to try and protect yourself. Of course, and it's an accident waiting to happen, really, you know. So should it be as well in that life. But, you know, that's that energy, that's that that wrongness of that life, you know, and living that life and the actions that that produces, you know. You've, you've referenced cheating death over a hundred times. What was, what was your first encounter with death or of cheating death? There are many. I mean, the truth is, you know, I can remember, in them days, it's fair, it's fair to say we would go into places daily where we really wouldn't know what was in there, what was waiting for us, or if we would come out, you know, and there would always be that thing, you know, you're living that life, you can be set up at any time, Leonard, right? Yeah. But, you know, I'll give you one example, um, you know, there was a club back in the day, it's called The Way In, that was um, in, a, in East London, yeah? People would know it under the bridge, Kingsland Road, yeah. right? Near Oxton, you know, just going up to Oxton. You know, and I was in there just one night, normal thing. A lot of guys used to get in there, we'd have a good time. It was kind of a hangout place on the block. And we'd go there, you know, we'd have a good time. You know, and I just happened to leave there one night. I forget what happened, but I just left. I had to go somewhere. But I found out half an hour later, three people had gone in there, you know, a little firm, you know, guns and all that looking for me. So I just missed them. So this is the kind of life that, that we're talking about. So then you found yourself being sentenced to 20 years in a Category A prison. Can you recount or remember how that day felt when you first heard that verdict? Yeah, I got 17 years. It was 17 years. 17. Um, but, but, but I, uh, yeah, we got that at the Bailey. You, you know, I told, I told you it was, it was armed robbery. But, you know, this was from the flying squad and they've been actively trying to arrest elements, friends of mine, and a lot of them was all cleared up. Now even, you know, there's books about this time, you know, I'm in a few books of the time and there's other stuff, even about the police who arrested me, you know, you know, my family and other people around me at this time, but they was planting guns on people, fit up kits, the ghost squad went in there, you know, they actually found a lot of stuff, they was taking money, you know, from robberies. It was really, really, this was the environment of the day. There's books and everything out about it out there, right? So this was what it was like. You know, this was what it was like. So when I actually, when I actually got the sentence, it was, um, it's crazy because I can remember standing there in the bailey and I had an epiphany like I always thought that I would get a lump of bird. I didn't know how or when. But I th always thought I was destined to get this. It was a really crazy, surreal moment. You know, when they give you, you know, 69 years we got all in all, but it ran concurrent, a lot of the sentences. You know, we just went downstairs, you know, I shook my Cody's hand. I said, well, that's it now, you know, and that was the start of it. So you enter prison. What is that like? Um, I'd been used to prison because of my earlier times in prison. But when you get a sentence like that, I mean, a Category A is treated much different than anyone else, you know. Um, it's all about security. Everywhere you go, you have a little book with a red A on it with a photo. So they sign you over, so they know where you are in the prison all the time. Your visits are different. Everything's monitored different. You know, where you go, prisons you can go, how you're moved, everything's different, right? Because your escape must be made impossible. You know, I mean, cat, uh, category A's, it's still the same now. The definition of a category A is that they're highly dangerous to the security of the public, the police or the state. Mm -hmm. So they fall into that, uh, into that category. It's still the same now. That's just to give you an idea, you know, of the conditions. And, um, but look, you know, the truth is when you get a big sentence like that, it takes you years until it actually hits you, Leonard. 
and it's uh, desperate. Hell on earth, really. What impact did it have on you? I um I cope very badly. Is the truth. I think most people do, but you know it affects people in different ways. But I I I cope very bad in the sense I got so rebellious because there was a lot of violence in there. You know, I mean, I see people get uh, killed in front of me and everything in there, and there was a lot of gang stuff going on there, and a lot of very it was a very very dangerous place, right? Which you couldn't escape from, obviously. So you know you had to come forward. And of course, role of someone who always come forward, that's what I've done in there as well. So, you know, um, I had to go with that. You know, I had to roll with that, you know, and I had to, you know, I had to live with the consequences of making them choices again. And um, I became very, very disruptive because I was even more angry. You know, in a sense, this is what kept me going. I know it's... But when you're at your lowest state of, uh, the lowest primitive state, you know, as a human being of survival and all this stuff within this darkness, it, it's hard for people to relate of what that will actually, actually be like. So, you know, I was put to special units. You know, I was moved different, I was treated differently. I'd done years, years in segregation. You know, there came a point I was, you know, I was with a lot of notorious prisoners of the day, as you know, Charlie Bronson, all of them. I know all these guys, and you know, then you know, I was I was classed as one of the uh, one of the most dangerous prisoners in the in the system at that time. I mean, Charlie Bronson is also referenced as one of the most dangerous prison prisoners in the UK. What was your experience with him um, while you was in there? Charlie, there's a lot of stuff in the papers about me and Charlie. You know, I'm in his books, you know, I'm in Charlie's books. And, you know, of course, there's a lot of stuff about Charlie in the press all the time. Mm. Charlie, I got on very, very well with Charlie. You know, it's like the thing about this press all the time. Yeah, you know, he's done all them years. You know, he's done a lot of time. Yes, he's done things wrong. But he has a lot of good sides to him, Charlie. He's got a lot of old school values and it's not what people would think. I always got on very, very well with Charlie. What did you do or kind of during the time where you was spe- doing this time? What were you telling yourself? Did you have an escape or did you have an idea of getting out one day and having a normal life? <sighs> I couldn't see a future in there, Leonard. I really couldn't. You know, you know, you know but if you think I'd done 11 years and nine months of that, I... I couldn't see 10 years in front of me. I couldn't see six years in front of me. I couldn't see what kind of human being I would be like that, how the world would be. How would, how would it be like outside after that? It's just a, it's a real dark place to be. But I always bettered myself. You know, I'd have the complete works of Shakespeare. I started my writing journey there. You know, I was always into very, you know, esoteric kind of books and studies. Uh, you know, I was always improving myself as much as I could mentally, spiritually, physically. What, what would you say the turning point in prison was for you? I think there were a lot of turning, turning points in prison, but prison for me then was more about survival, really, mm-hmm. just to get out. I knew there were a lot more battles to come. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, when I say turning point, I mean, it was very easy to go into prison and to come back out, do the same thing, get yourself back in, which is a, a problem a lot of people suffer, being institutionalised and, and get going back in, whether that's in back into prison or back onto drugs. What was the turning point where you said you're not going to go back in this cycle? I, I knew that that life was, was, was not for me. You know, I mean, I'd, uh, I'd had many instances you know, I had people who knew me 25 years and had set me up to get me killed. So I knew that this wasn't the life that I wanted. But I come to the stage where there was, um, uh, I couldn't hurt the people in my life no more. I couldn't hurt anyone no more. i just come to that time where I've had enough. Wow. So you've had many highs and many lows. Um, and you've been in environments where you've dealt with death 
and you've spent time in prison. How have you learned to deal with fear and setbacks? I think I've I've always took took the best from people, not people who didn't didn't know what they was on about, but people who I thought really had something to offer. I'm still the same today. You know, and I can remember back in the day, you know, I was lucky enough to have some really good, really good teachers in some ways. And, you know, when I was uh, uh, boxing training and stuff like that, you know, learning the art of boxing. And I was told really, really early on, fear is your friend. It's always going to keep you safe. It's never going to harm you, fear, right? But the way to deal with it is to turn it around at that point really, really, and don't recognise it as fear. Recognise it as excitement. You're alive. Translate it, right? This is one way of doing it. And there's a thing about fearlessness because it's like human beings have habits and when you've been through so much traumatic, you, you do get desensitised in the sense that fear in certain situations, they don't affect you the same way that they would of other people who wouldn't have been exposed to so much unremitting fearful fearful circumstances all the time so it dilutes you know it dilutes you're aware of it but of course you get forced into a different you know a different kind of person during the time of your uh your life of crime in regards to those underworld activities what kind of money were you making that life you know i always say we'd make a lot of money there's no question but that life, it's more important to say that one minute you would have a fortune, you know, the next day, you know, you wouldn't have nothing again. This is the way that life was. So much money would come through your hands, but you don't respect money like that. So you was never destined to really keep it in the right way. It's like a river that, so, that moves. So was it worth it? Absolutely not. You know, I mean, how can it be worth it? You know, I mean, even if, let's say you get a million pound, right, you know, on a robbery or something like that, then you go away for 12 years of your life, away from your family, 12 years. Not even in maths is that going to add up anyway. It would never be worth that. Nothing is worth that. So that being said, where do you see yourself five years from now? You know, it's important to say that, look, you know, I come out, I transformed my life. I, you know, I went on, you know, I went to university and business school. I, you know, I learned how to build companies. You know, I started from the bottom, really, you know, worked my way up brick by brick. You know, when I'd made that decision to transform, you know, I went on, I'm a, I'm a peace ambassador. Last year I was nominated for an International Peace Prize. You know, I have a best-selling book out, you know, as you know, which is going to be a film. So I've uh, transformed my life. But that was a process that's 10 years in the making now, right? But it can be done, right? And would you say that this version that you're becoming has a lot less maybe monetary value as what your criminal life was providing, but has a better rewarding feel or, or is it catching up to, to that? No, you know, I've got a clear answer, you know, you know, no way, even in a monetary way, does my life now and what I achieve now even equate to any kind of money I used to get then, you know. And how, how and how, how, because a lot of people suffer with this, you know, a lot of people, young people yeah, um, that are involved in alternative, you know, drug selling or, you know, whatever it is they do, a lot of people don't really see the, the, the sacrifice of going down the straight line and what it takes but the reward of what it means to actually get nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize and, you know, be part of the, 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 the change of other people. And I think it's important to kind of, you know, let people know that um, it's worth it, you know, because I think, I think at that time, especially in, in your journey, it feels like you've had to take the long road in order to realise that being short-sighted, short-sighted has a big cost, right? And that led you to writing your first book. Tell us a bit about your book. Yeah, I have the book here. You know, I want to give you one. You know, I'm going to give you one here, yes. Leonard. You know, I love your work and what you're doing as well. You're doing wonderful stuff. Yeah, it's a monkey puzzle you, tree here. So, you know, I've signed you a copy here. Thank right. you very much. There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, 
the monkey puzzle tree is a a very human story. It details all my life. It's a it's a biopic. Um, it in no way glamorizes the life, but it really goes into it to really reveal you know the emotions and the the hooks and the traps you know the solutions more importantly of what it's like to actually live a life like that right and there are bits of us scattered everywhere in it i mean it's it's already in pre-production as you know to be a major hollywood hollywood film it's all over the press, yeah. Um, you know, we've had some massive names, you know, attached to this script, and it's it's it, it's a a very human story, as I say. But it's unique in the in in that it shows the transformation and the redemption arc, you know, and the elevation of me as a human being after overcoming so much adversity. It's a wonderful book. It's an international bestseller. Amazing. What do people misunderstand about Stephen Dillon? <laughs> That's a great question, which no one has really asked me before like that, Leonard. I think a lot of us are misunderstood. I think human beings misunderstand other human beings too much all the time. That's the truth. I know that I certainly wasn't. And I know that people make a lot of judgments about people that are not even close. You know, that's something to really look at when you want to be successful. You know, because me, I always look at the truth. You know, I call it the shit list. We look at the shit list first. We go there first. We deal with the difficult difficult problems first. Because I know that's where the solutions are. That's where the pivot is. That's where the elevation is in solving these problems. So I never shy away from the difficult stuff. I always look to go there first. So, so I can get that out of the way and solve it quickly. It's very powerful. What would the... Stephen today, tell the 15-year-old Stephen Jim. You know, I would say time is the governance of all things. You know, it really is the most precious commodity. Even this time here we have, we don't get to get this back, right? So it's the most precious thing. People, places and things, money for instance, it comes and goes, right? It's like an energy, right? But time, to waste so much of it, I'd say, look, you know, you can have a lot of trauma and a lot of pain, you know, or you can change that. And you can let time work for you by enabling yourself to be the human being you're meant to be, serve others and build wonderful things in this life, but you can do it quicker. So that would be something I would like to tell the younger me. Last but not least, who is Stephen Gillian? Stephen Gillen is is not what people think and this is what I'm saying about people having so much sure ideas about other people you know many times they're not even close do a bit more research I always do now you know and I I never make judgments me I'm I'm a very humble grounded person because of what I've been through but I'm very courageous you know I have very clear ideas about behaviour and about how things should be, again, because of, you know, because of the life that I've led. But behind all that, for all what people say, really, I'm very simple. It's always about others. You know, I want to be the best human being I can be. For me, it's about uh, developing all the time, you know, and I see so much. I see so much, you know. You know, and there are many people that say, wow, you know, that's really cool you do all that stuff. Yeah, and that's great, you know, that's great. And But I see so much more, so I'm always going on to the next, the next mountain to climb, you know. We're already on to another book now and, you know, another stuff. And uh, I've got a foundation coming now where we're really going to help the people I want to help. So this is the next marker that, you know, is a real privilege for me and the wonderful people around me to work towards them. Stephen, I think it's incredible, your story, and the, the, the fact that you've been able to not only overcome, but be able to come through and be able to inspire the next generation to prevent people from making similar mistakes or mistakes of their own. And I think the, the, the highest form, as Nipsey Hussle says, of um, inspiration is to inspire. And I think that's what you're doing. So listen, 
thank you very much for sitting with us. It's a big pleasure. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing this on Hollywood screens as well. The Monkey Puzzle Tree. I'm sure it's going to be a crazy, exciting and thrilling one. And of course, we want to be up to date with your new books that come out as well. And we'll make sure we put this all over my come up as well. Thanks. Yeah, you know, and as I said, you know, it's a real pleasure. Thank you for having me and well done with your wonderful work. Thank you. Hi, my name's Stephen Gillen and you're watching my come up, the voice of entrepreneurial culture.